Seven years have passed since my divorce from Kate. This pathetic bastard is still in town. She was promoted and has been the superintendent of our city's school system for the past three years. My youngest daughter, Carla, was starting the second half of her sophomore year in high school. Like her sisters before her, she was an excellent student, a triple-A athlete, and active in the school's theater and music departments. Carla is the last daughter left at home. Kayla is currently a junior at MIT, and if her performance continues, she will remain in school and pursue a master's degree in mechanical engineering. Kara is a freshman at Boston University studying finance and accounting. Carla was only eight years old when I divorced her lying, cheating, gonorrhea-ridden mother. While her older sisters knew about their mother's betrayal and mostly avoided her, Carla did not understand the full consequences of Kate's actions. As a result, she ate dinner with her mother one or two days a week and often spent weekend nights at Kate's house. I was in my office, on the second floor of an old converted barn that I had inherited from my grandfather. I felt disgusted with myself as I reviewed the New Year's resolutions I had made just a month ago. One lose 15 pounds. I typed one. Two exercise 45 minutes a day. I missed seven days. Three refused to snack after dinner. Damn. I averaged two snacks and a beer every night. Four, have sex twice a week. I averaged one date per week. Five, write one story a month and post them on Literotica. It was the beginning of February, and I still hadn't written a single story. Six, clean out old files from my filing cabinets. Over the past quarter century, my personal and professional life has accumulated enough paperwork to completely fill 23 four-drawer filing cabinets. I rarely went into the file cabinet. For the past five years, almost all of my files have been stored on my computer and in the cloud. I thought about calling an industrial shredder to the shed and dumping the contents of every cabinet drawer into the shredder, but I knew there were irreplaceable treasures hidden among the junk. I committed to cleaning out one box a day, but never started the project. I threw the list of solutions on my desk, rose from my chair with a grunt, and walked over to the file cabinet. I completely pulled the oldest file box out of the closet and placed it on the folding table. I pulled a large trash can over to the table and began combing through each folder. I admit, the project turned out to be much more interesting than I thought. I found records of the first house I rented when I was working for my grandfather as a second grader. I came across a folder filled with United States government bonds that my daughter's grandparents bought for them early in their lives. The file cabinet contained old photographs, early school projects and report cards, and original birth and baptismal certificates. On the fourth day of the project, my life went topsy-turvy. I found documents about my ex-wife's hospital stay when she gave birth to Carla. I smiled as I looked at the costs listed on the documents compared to today's prices. And then I saw it. Kate, my ex, had blood type 1 plus on her documents. It was impossible. I also had blood type 1, as did my two older daughters. Carla, the youngest, had a much rarer 4. Over the next few hours, I found six separate folders containing old medical records that confirmed our blood types. There was no mistake. Carla was not my biological daughter. After countless hours and several detailed plans to punish my ex-wife, I saw the light. I realized there was nothing I could do that would jeopardize the two precious years I had left with Carla before she left home for college. More than a week passed before I decided to keep this grotesque family secret a secret for now. I was sure that my ex didn't know that I wasn't Carla's father. If she had known, she would have fought for custody and most likely would have gotten all three girls. At the very least, I was grateful that I was allowed to raise my daughters. The only active action I took was to quietly take an official DNA test. The test confirmed what I already knew. Almost exactly two years later, in the week between Christmas and New Year's, I was sitting at the dinner table with my three daughters. As always, it was a joy to be surrounded by their teasing, laughter, and jokes. I had been preparing all day, 
and when our meal was finished and the conversation had died down, I looked at Kayla and Kara and said, I need to talk to Carla. Will you put away your dishes? Both girls agreed and began to tease their sister that she was in trouble and would be punished until the end of the Christmas holidays. I told Carla, Why don't you come to my office? I want to talk to your sisters. Carla teased her sister, saying, Look who's in trouble now. With a smile and a wave, she walked out the back door and headed to my office above the barn. What are your plans for tonight? Kara replied, We're going to the barn to hang out with the old school crowd. I nodded for a few seconds and tried to smile, but my emotions began to overwhelm me. Dad, is everything okay? Kayla asked. It took me a little time to come to my senses. I asked the girls. Is it okay if you cancel your plans? I have a feeling your sister will need you both. Is Carla all right? asked Keeley. Is she sick? Kara asked. She's not sick. I have some very bad news to tell her. This is actually terrible news. I know she needs your support. Tell us, Dad, Kara begged. I thought about telling the older girls first, but I didn't get around to it until Kara asked her question. Your sister is already 18. She is an adult. I have to tell her first. It does not take a lot of time. I'll let you know when I need your help. I left the table and the worried girls and walked through the backyard to my office. Carla was sitting on the couch across the room from my desk. Instead of sitting next to her, I sat on the coffee table opposite her. We sat knee to knee. I asked, Remember when I put my old papers out of the back file cabinet? Carla nodded and replied, Yes, this was several years ago. I was very careful and looked through every folder in every drawer. I knew that among the useless papers there were important family treasures. Carla continued to nod in understanding. I found something in the papers that I need to talk to you about. It is very important. This information made me feel physically ill. I'm still devastated. Normally I would try to protect you from such trauma, but it is vital for you to know, especially before you leave for college. I want to tell you now, while your sisters are home and can support you, I also want you to have time to become familiar with the information before you leave for college. Dad, I'm afraid. Don't be afraid. We will deal with this as a family. I handed Carla the folder I had brought from the kitchen. When she opened it, I said, These are medical records from the time your mother was in the hospital when you were born. Fine. Carla was looking through the pages in the folder when she came to a page with a large red circle. She read the information in the circle and said, I didn't know that mom has blood type 1. Carla is a smart girl, and she enjoys all areas of science. I saw the wheels of her brain working. She flipped through the few remaining pages in the folder. There were no additional designated areas. Carla took a minute to digest the information contained in the packet and then looked up at me with questioning eyes. She sobbed and reached out to me, and I jumped up on the sofa next to her. I hugged her when she started crying. Dad, what is your blood type? When I answered, one, Carla howled like a wounded animal. She pressed herself against me with all her might and sobbed. You are my only dad, and you are my baby. We hugged each other for a very long time. Every few minutes I heard a ding, indicating that I had received a message. Pulling back and looking into Carla's eyes, I told her, Your sisters write to me and want to come and be with you. Let me invite them. Before I had time to take out my phone, Carla asked, Do they know? I shook my head and told her, I thought it was important to tell you first but we must share information with them. Nodding, Carla allowed me to include her brothers and sisters in the list. I grabbed my phone from the table and typed into the text app. The income. Carla hugged me and cried on my chest. She cried even harder when we heard her sister's feet running up the stairs to my office. The girls jogged through my office, climbed onto the couch, and we all hugged each other. After a few minutes, Kayla asked, What has our bitch mother done now? 
I laughed and replied, How do you know that this is connected with your mother? Kara replied, We have ups and downs, like any normal family. But when everything goes wrong, the reason is always mom. A tiny voice buried deep in my chest agreed as Carla said. She's a slut. Kayla and Kara were stunned by their sister's comment, and equally stunned when I said sternly, Young lady, we don't use swear words. Carla giggled, and we pulled away from each other. We took our seats again. Kara and Kayla sat next to their little sister, and I sat down on the table in front of the trio. Carla looked at me and said, I can't tell them. Dad, what will you say? I began. I will always be Carla's dad. No one will ever take this honor and privilege away from me. Kayla and Kara looked confused, and I continued. I recently found out that I am not her biological father. It took a moment to process the information, and then all hell broke loose. Over the next few minutes, there were a lot of tears, hugs, and just as much cursing and screaming. When everything was quiet, Kayla asked, Who is this asshole donor of biological material? I don't know, I admitted. Kara asked her sister, Are you going to ask your mother who your father is? I surprised the group when I told them. I don't think your mother realizes that I'm not Carla's biological father. They all turned and looked at me in surprise. Why do you say that? Kara asked. I explained. Our divorce was quite controversial. At the same time, because of your mother's position in our city, she had to be careful not to ruin her reputation. She didn't want everyone to know that she was the reason for the divorce. I promised to keep my mouth shut if she gave me primary custody. All three girls nodded in understanding. I'll never be 100% sure, but knowing your mom, I think she would have fought for custody if she knew I wasn't Carla's biological father. The court wouldn't have much of a choice, and I suspect you would be handed over to your mother. She's dead to me. At Carla's remark, her sisters nodded in agreement. She continued, I don't want that bitch to know about this. At least until I come to my senses. We were silent because we expected something more to happen. Someday I will make this cheetah regret the day she was born. And then, looking at me, she concluded, I hope you don't have to pay bail for me. We all giggled and I asked, can I give you some advice? Of course, Dad. I will support you in everything you do. But remember, you must be able to look at yourself in the mirror. Don't stoop to your mother's incredibly low level. The first call from Kate came three weeks later. What the hell is going on with Carla? She screamed into the phone. Carla is fine. She's perfect. Hell no. The only time I've seen her since Christmas was at my parents' house two weeks ago. So what? I asked. She was beautiful to everyone except me. She treated me like crap. She doesn't answer my calls or messages. She didn't come to dinner. Something is wrong, and I want to know what it is. Will you ask her? I answered. No, I won't ask. She communicates normally with me and her sisters. Her teachers didn't tell me anything was wrong. Coach Amy said Carla is a natural leader and the best captain on the girls' basketball team. It seems like you're the only one who has problems with Carla, and I don't want to get involved. I hung up and didn't answer when she called back a minute later. The next few months flew by. It was late spring, and basketball games had given way to lacrosse. I sometimes saw Kate at Carla's games. After every game, Carla would find me in the crowd of parents and hug me. She completely ignored her mother. Kate called me weekly and demanded that I find out what was wrong. After several calls, I decided not to answer and deleted all messages without listening to them. At the end of the school year, I attended the Alumni Awards Banquet. Carla received three awards. She was given an award in chemistry as the best student and an award in the drama department. No one was surprised when she was named the winner of the Glasgow Award for being the best female athlete in her graduating class. Carla was allowed to give a short three-minute speech as a Glasgow Award winner. Carla not only thanked her family, 
coaches, and teammates, but also gave many specific examples of how each of them contributed to her success on the court and playing field. The honesty of her statements touched everyone in the room. I noticed a few raised eyebrows, especially among school staff, when Carla did not mention the contributions of the superintendent of schools, her mother. The high school's commencement ceremony took place Thursday evening, a week after the senior banquet. We had 532 graduates. Due to the size of the class, the graduation ceremony was held each year in the main gymnasium of the local college. I sat in the stands with Kayla and Kara. I didn't see my parents, but I knew they were nearby. In the stands opposite us, I noticed the girls' grandparents and slutty aunties. I couldn't be happier when the student audience and many in attendance applauded when they heard the master of ceremonies announce Carla Lillian Harrington. I smiled widely as I watched my daughter walk proudly and confidently into the graduation hall. I wondered how Carla would handle this moment, but I decided that I had enough confidence in my youngest daughter to know that she would not embarrass herself. You see, the school superintendent, her mother, was the first person Carla would meet in line to receive her diploma. Kate proudly held Carla's diploma, waiting for her daughter to come up and shake her hand. Everyone present was in disbelief when Carla stopped 20 feet from her mother. Just as Kate began to lose her bright smile, Carla raised two fists in front of her, palms facing the ceiling. She paused for a moment and then slowly extended each middle finger. Thousands of those present sighed in unison, and then there was dead silence. I believe Carla's cry when she sent her mother could have been heard half a mile away. Carla turned on her heel and walked back to the stage entrance. As she walked past the line of students waiting to take the stage, several of them raised their hands and greeted Carla. Carla returned to her seat as the noise from the crowd increased. She sat with her legs crossed, like a lady should, and her hands folded in her lap. No one could help but notice her radiant smile from ear to ear. The teacher who announced the name of each graduate was an old-timer who had seen it all. The teacher took only a few seconds to name the next student, David Michael Haverall, and the graduation ceremony continued. My family and I have lived in the city for over 20 years. Because of my business connections, my former superintendent's position, and the reputations of all three daughters, we were well known. I suspect many people were confused by the Harrington family's reaction to Carla's outburst. I remained calm, but my brain was racing. I quickly decided that the fireworks were far from over and tried to determine what Carla might do next. Kayla and Kara were sitting to my right, giggling and clapping like idiots. Fortunately, the graduation ceremony ended without further disruption. After the ceremony ended, the girls and I went to the gymnasium hall to find Carla. As we huddled together, I noticed that two sets of grandparents and the girls' aunts were also standing together, but for some reason they were not approaching us. We only had to wait a few minutes before we saw Carla running through the lobby. She rushed to me, hugged my neck, and said, Oh, I forgot my diploma. She was busy hugging her sisters when Jim Miller, the school principal, approached me. Jim looked at me and said, Carla is already a graduate, so I have no opportunity to punish her for her behavior. However, I deserve an explanation from Carla. I agree and will insist that she come to your office next week, I told him and quickly added. Can I give you some advice? Jim was taken aback by my request, so I continued. I didn't know that Carla was going to crash the ceremony but I know why she did it. I'm guessing what we witnessed is the first act in a two-act play. My advice is to stand over there. I pointed to the corner of the hall, about 20 feet away. I finished. I don't think you want to be in the middle of the second act. I looked over Jim's shoulder and saw Kate. She noticed our group and walked quickly in our direction, as fast as her four-inch heels would allow. I leaned over and whispered, Kate will be here in about 15 seconds. It will be terrible. Jim looked over his shoulder and saw the same expression on Kate's face as I did. He nodded curtly to me and retreated into the corner. 
I wonder if Kate noticed that the closer she got to our group, the quieter the hall became. I glanced quickly at Carla. I didn't know what she had up her sleeve, but I could tell she was ready. As Kate walked past a group of grandparents and aunts, they caught up with her. Kate stopped at arm's length from Carla and demanded, What in the name of God was that? Carla's deliberate grin made her mother's face turn crimson. I'll answer your question if you let me ask it first. It seemed like everyone in the hall was trying to crawl closer to hear what was being said. Kate was too angry to answer, so Carla asked much louder than necessary. Who is my biological father? There was dead silence as Kate's face contorted. She gasped. What? Kara jumped up and repeated. My sister wants to know the name of her biological father. Kate pointed at me and almost shouted, Your biological father is standing over there. I shook my head and said, No, that's not true. Kate's mouth dropped open, and before she could make another sound, Kayla announced to Carla, In the month you were conceived, she slept with so many people that she doesn't even know your father's name. Kate swung her open hand at her eldest daughter. I saw her coming, but I couldn't do anything to stop her. Out of nowhere, Carla's maternal grandfather reached out and squeezed Kate's wrist. You will never hit my granddaughter, George ordered. George came up to me and asked, You're not Carla's biological father. I shook my head and told him, No. How long have you known this? he asked. Not for long. He moved away slightly and crouched down so he could look Carla in the eyes. George took a moment to collect his thoughts before he said, If things hadn't happened the way they did, I wouldn't have had three perfect granddaughters. You and your sisters are perfect in large part because of the person who has his hand on your shoulder. Your dad, tears ran down George's cheek as he continued, Your grandmother and I. Both your grandparents wish you hadn't gotten hurt like that, but know that we love you and are incredibly proud of the young woman you have become. George leaned over and kissed Carla on the cheek. George kissed Kayla and Kara. Turning to me, he hugged me and whispered sadly, I don't know what bad I did to deserve three sluts as daughters. He kissed my cheek and turned to my father. George stood up to his full height and squared his shoulders. Looking at my father, he said, I'm sorry that my family caused your family such pain and heartache. I will be forever ashamed. George took his wife Anne's hand and slowly led her towards the exit. The crowd parted to allow the elderly couple to pass. I was incredibly proud of Carla when she joined hands with her sisters and called out, Wait, grandparents, you promised me a festive dinner. As they passed my family, Kayla said, You better believe you're coming too. She pulled my mother by the hand and practically dragged her along with her. Dad glanced at me quickly. I smiled, winked, and said, Enjoy. Kate, her older sisters Mickey and Jen, and I watched as both grandparents and three granddaughters walked out of the hall. Kate turned and asked, Can we have some privacy and talk? Her eyes were wet and she was on the verge of tears. I considered Kate's request for half a second before shaking my head. No, thank you, Kate. I have nothing to talk to you about. As I turned and began to make my way through the crowd of onlookers, Kate shouted, Please, Chris, we have to fix everything. At the age of 52, I was semi-retired. The home rental industry was saturated with wishers and weekend warriors, who were convinced that anyone could make money renovating a home for a profit. I made additional changes in the direction of my business. I helped create a real estate fund that invested in old, outdated shopping centers. Our group purchased older properties, often with significant tax incentives from the city and state. We renovated and updated properties and rented them out. I discovered that I could find new projects and keep track of renovations using just my laptop and mobile phone, and as a result, I could work from anywhere in the world. The previous summer, I bought a small motor home and headed to Tennessee. 
I spent five weeks working several hours every morning and hiking the Blue Ridge Mountains every afternoon. I lost almost 30 pounds while walking almost 300 miles. I ate fish that I caught from nearby rivers and streams and lived a relatively simple lifestyle. The following spring, on a Wednesday afternoon, I felt restless. I was sitting in my home office and I was bored. Without thinking about the possible consequences, I left the office, went into my shed, and hitched my Jeep Wrangler to the back of the motorhome. After packing a few days' worth of clothes, I headed the van west and began the two-hour drive to my daughter Kylie's house. I arrived in the small town in Westchester County, New York that Kayla and her family had chosen for their home. I pulled the camper into the driveway and unhitched the Jeep. By three o'clock in the afternoon I had the water and electricity hooked up and was sitting in a camp chair in the driveway enjoying a book. Less than twenty minutes later, a school bus stopped two doors down from my daughter's house. Five small children got off the school bus, and I watched as I recognized my grandson. He shouted, Dad, it's me, Bryce, I shouted back. Bryce, it's me, Dad. Bryce ran across two lawns and fell into my outstretched arms. We talked for a few minutes, after which I asked the six-year-old, Do you want to play ball? He agreed, ran into the garage, used the remote keypad to open the door, and took out his baseball glove. We had just settled down on the front lawn and made a few throws when a local police car pulled up to the curb in front of the house. A few seconds later, a second police car arrived from the opposite direction. Two policemen got out of the first car, and a third one got out of the second patrol car. Although I was concerned, I was sure that someone had asked the police to investigate the strange adult playing with Bryce. I crouched down next to Bryce, pointed at the lone police officer, and said in a voice loud enough for all the police officers to hear, Bryce, I want you to go up to this cop and say, Hello, I'm Bryce. How can I help you? I pointed to the other two officers and said, I'll go up to these police officers and say, Hello, I'm Papa. I'm Bryce's grandfather. How can I help you? You could see the cops relax a little when I slapped Bryce on the butt and he jogged towards the cop. I didn't hear what Bryce was saying, but I responded in kind when Bryce gave me a thumbs up. I approached two other officers. One of them was an adult woman with sergeant stripes on her uniform. The other officer looked too young to be a police officer. Approaching them, I introduced myself. The young officer said, Your grandson's nanny after school is a neighbor. She called us when she saw Bryce playing with you. Obviously, she had never met you and was very worried when he did not come to her house. When the officer finished, Bryce and the third officer joined our group. I asked Bryce, Where do you usually go when you get off the school bus? Bryce pointed down the street. There was an elderly woman standing on the steps and looking in our direction. Bryce said, I'm going to Mrs. Walsh's house. She takes care of me until my mother comes home. At that moment, Kayla's SUV screeched to a stop in her driveway. She jumped out of the car. She was alarmed, but relief spread across her face. Kayla told us, When Papa Harrington comes to town, things always liven up. After Kayla arrived, everything became clear quite quickly. As she was talking to the young police officers, the sergeant asked me, How do you like your motorhome? I answered her, I've only had it for a year. Last summer I explored the Blue Ridge Mountains in Tennessee and really enjoyed my stay. This summer I'm going to head out west and hike the Rockies for a month or so. The sergeant admitted, I'm retiring in two months and I'm already thinking about getting lost for a year, exploring all the places I'd like to see. The day was very hot, even at 7,500 feet on Patterson Peak. I was shoulder deep in the water of a small lake located in the southern Rocky Mountains. Sergeant Lydia Wilson was as naked as me and we had sex. After meeting at Kayla's house, Lydia and I got together for drinks a couple of nights later. Our reason was to talk about RV life, but we spent a lot of time sharing stories from our lives. 
The following weekend, we met in New York for dinner and a Broadway show. By the time Lydia officially retired, we would get together on Friday nights and spend the weekends together. No one was surprised when I flew to Colorado with Lydia as my co-pilot.